Hi everyone. Um, thank you all for arriving promptly for the webinar. Um, we're just going to get started as we've got quite a few bits to get through today. Um, today's uh, webinar will be talking through how to build a countryside stewardship application with the Land App. Um, I'm Dan, the Innovations and Partnerships Lead here at Land App, and today I really want to just spend about an hour demonstrating the key functions that will be useful for you if you're building a countryside stewardship application, um, either for this year or potentially into the future. A bit of housekeeping before we start is that as this is a webinar, um, as usual, your camera and microphone will remain off throughout the duration of the webinar. However, we do want to hear from you. There is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, so feel free to ask any questions you might have. We've got a dedicated session um, for about 15 minutes at the end of the uh, demo. Um, I've not got any more calls this afternoon, which is quite nice. So I will be hanging around for another 15 or 20 minutes after the webinar is finished. So if you want to come off mute and ask them any questions in person, I'll be more than happy to you know, have a conversation then. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and it will be added to our YouTube channel. Um, so just bear with us. It takes about three or five days to process that. And finally, we've got a feedback survey that um, will pop up on your screen once you leave the webinar, either at the end or if you have to leave early, not a problem. Um, I think there's six questions, please do answer them. Um, there's a couple of quite important ones around our roadmap, in particular with uh, digital submissions. So please do um, answer those questions if you can. I'm gonna start off um, once I just finished um, the introduction, just touching on a couple of key rules for countryside stewardship when you're using the Land App. Um, uh, I'm assuming that people, most people on this call are at least familiar with what the Land App is. However, I will be going over some basic principles as well. And then I'm gonna spend the majority of the time doing a live demo of how you can draft an application, starting from importing your rural payment agency data, using the countryside stewardship template, uh, viewing and editing um, your plans using our data layers um, and then downloading the data ready for application. So that's both the, the, uh, the annex form uh, template through the um, countryside stewardship download, but also how to print off RPA compliant maps as part of your supporting evidence. Um, we've also then um, recently updated our photo evidencing um, functionality. Uh, in line with our mobile app that's just been released. So I'm just going to explain a bit more about that as well. There will then be time for Q&A at the end. So um, please do put your questions into the um, Q&A function. And we have, I think, enabled the upvoting system. So if there's a particular question that you really want answering, please do upvote it uh, um, as it comes through. Today, I'm going to try and show best practice. So I will be going as slow as I can, but as there's a lot to cover, there might be times when I go quite quickly and I apologize for that. Um, but if you do need to you know, recap on anything, you can either look at this webinar on our YouTube channel, or there's a load of other data, a load of other uh, webinars on the YouTube channel, um, particularly the introductory training for those are new and fresh to the Land App, I'd recommend going to watch. So the key rules when mapping um, a countryside stewardship application on the land app, um, th these are five rules that I've, I've just pulled out after you know, lots of experience of people, uh, including doing some applications myself, that just to be aware of, um, to make sure that you're getting the most out of the platform. Um, the rule number one is always use the RPA land covers to build your plan. And this is accessible through an SBI number download, so a single business identifier. And the reason for this is, is the field, uh, the parcels themselves are um, structured by the land cover type, which allows you to quite easily cross-reference eligibility. So you might have a whole field parcel that's got a bit of woodland to the side or maybe an ineligible feature. Land covers will show that, your land parcels won't. And I'll explain a bit more about that during the demo. The second one, particularly important if you're, you're, an, you know, you're an advisor or you're doing multiple applications in one year, please just name your maps consistently um, rather than just calling them all Countryside Stewardship 2023. You know, use a, use a uh, consistent structure. I recommend, for example, CSS underscore farm name underscore surname. We'll keep the data nice and tidy. Uh, rule number three is just ensure that your capital items are being allocated to the correct fields. Um, this is one of the biggest errors we see. Um, it doesn't happen often, but when it does, it, it can get quite messy um, and I'm just going to show you how to eliminate any risk of that error being um, generated but basically always select the field parcel that you want that capital item to be allocated to before drawing it um, so you don't want to you know have 
tree planting assigned to one field parcel that actually the trees are across the whole farm. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. Rule number four is just try and avoid overlapping polygons when you can using the subtract function. And what I mean by that is if you've got two features, just make sure they're not overlapping. They are two dimensional. However, there are some exceptions, some supplementary payments that you can get through countryside stewardship where the options can be co-located. And I'll demonstrate how to handle that as well. The, the fifth point, which is relevant to that, that first point I made, but please, please just cross-reference cross the land use code with the option eligibility. So if you are putting down an arable option, please ensure that you're putting it in an arable field. Um, if the land use type is incorrect, please do use an RLE1 form and you know, officially log that change with Rural Payment Agency as soon as you can. Um, even if you, yeah, you think it's arable and they think it's grassland, you need to make sure you're updating it formally through the RLE1 process. Just a note before I move on to the demo is that the mobile app was released earlier this year. Um, it was released specifically to help people with their evidencing for countryside stewardship. So it's a good time to speak about this. So it is only available to our subscribers. So you need to be on a, a monthly or annual subscription with us to have access to it. However, what it allows you to do is it allows you to quickly gather evidence um, photos you know, before the stewardship scheme has begun, particularly for capital items. And obviously um, during the uh, process of delivering those capital items, evidencing the, the during and after photos. If you're a, an advisor doing multiple applications, um, one thing that we're seeing more and more people do is actually get the professional subscription and therefore the mobile app for their clients just for a month or two and asking the clients to go and do the photo evidencing through the mobile app. It saves you having to walk over 10 or 15 different farms um, and they can just go around in the morning on a quad bike. So that's another option and happy to provide further information if you need. Oh, not on Q&A yet, but a bit premature. OK, I'm going to move across to uh, the, the demo now. And just for the first couple of moments, just to explain what the land app is for anyone who's fresh. Um, so the land app is a mapping platform based at thelandapp.com. So we're not a desktop application. You don't need to download anything onto your computer. You can access it through any web browser. I'm going to be using Google Chrome during the demo as we do opt. We do feel it's optimized for Google Chrome. However, it does work on Microsoft Edge, Safari, et cetera. On our website, um, you can create a free account by hitting the join for free button or the sign up button. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to log in. But just to point to you a couple of sections of the website that might be of interest, um, we've got different pages for the different customer groups. Um, so farmers uh, is the particular focus for the moment and land agency. Um, we've also got community pages, which is where we host a lot of blogs, thought, le thought leadership pieces, etc. And we have the links to our events. So all of you have got here either through our marketing emails or through the website, but do keep an eye on this page if you wanna see which webinars are coming up next. Um, pricing and about pages, um, just include further information about those um, specifics. Um, but do find, if you find yourself with five minutes, I would recommend coming to the community page in particular. So once you've signed up and followed the process, and I'm going to assume you all have, or at least um, can do that after the session, you can then log in. Once you've logged into the map or into the land app, you're initially met with what we call the, the maps homepage. And this is where all of your maps that you've created sit. Each one of these thumbnails represents a different uh, farm or holding. Um, and if you're on the professional subscription as well, is you can use our team tags and start filtering data based on particular uh, use cases and particular tags that you may have used um, and there's guidance on that particularly if you're working for an agency that's got multiple farms multiple clients um, the professional subscription allows you and your team to quite tidily um, look after all the different data points if you're um, also uh, uh, got any maps that you've been invited to so if people have sent you a request or maybe you're you're a farmer and one of your agents has invited you to their map you'll find that within the shared with me button. So if you can't see it in your organization's maps or your maps, do just click the shared with me button and that loads up all the maps that have been shared with you outside of your organization. Um, and that's a, a common thing who will message us saying, I can't find the maps. Um, but yeah, have a look in the shared with me before, um, before panicking too much. So to start the demo, I'm gonna create a new map by hitting the new button at the top of the screen. It might be hidden behind my head, depending on where your um, 
uh, depending on where your camera has got me. But you hit new and that allows you to then create a new map, which I'm going to give the name CSS webinar. Um, and I'm going to give it the team tag demo maps. So my team know this is just a demo and create an empty map. Once you've created that, um, uh, you're dropped onto an interactive base map over Birmingham. And by default, your base map is OpenStreetMap. You can change that um, base map to a number of different base maps that we've got. Um, for example, Bing Imagery is one of our free base maps that allow you to um, look at the, uh, the whole of the country using satellite um, Earth observation data. Um, this one's actually aerial photography, so it's updated every three years by a plane flying over the country. Um, and there's other base maps you can use. Um, we do host ordnance survey data, so we're an ordnance survey partner. Um, and if you're on the free products, you need to top up credits to be able to use um, ordnance survey data. Um, and our professional subscribers can either keep using the credit system or if they're eligible for the an ordnance survey data hub account, they are entitled to um, wire in their data hub account to land app, which just gives them access to a thousand pounds of free data a month. If you want more information on that and to know whether you're eligible, let us know um, and we can help you with some further information. But all of those base maps then are interactive as well. So you can scroll around by clicking and dragging, et cetera, et cetera. Just to note, recently we've also released the LIDAR base map as well, which um, is from the Environment Agency, but takes up, we're just doing a bit of a refresh on that. So I'm not sure if it's going to load this morning because we're having a little bug with it this morning that should be fixed this afternoon, I hope. Um, that, ba that base map on LIDAR, by the way, is only available for uh, professional subscribers. So for the demo today, I'm going to spend most of it on Ordnance Survey Lite, just because it gives me a grey background and makes the colours stand off a little bit, but I might be flicking to uh, Bing imagery as well. So for you to first create your um, application or to start building a countryside geosphere application, you need to get the data down from the Rural Payment Agency onto your map. And the way that you do that is you can hit the new button at the top left and hit import data. When you hit import data, there's four different ways that you can get data in. You can pick from land registry, you can import data from external GIS uh, software or CAD software, or you can just um, create from an existing plan, which I haven't got at the moment. But I'm for the demo and for every countryside stewardship, rule number one is please import from the Rural Payment Agency using a single business identifier. Oh, that's not what I want. Let's get an SBI number like so and paste that in when you paste this in here you can see i had that red error um, the land app will automatically check whether your sbi number is eligible so providing it stays green you know you've got an, uh, a, a correct sbi number typed in the data sets then what are available from the rpa are land covers land parcels and hedgerows and i would recommend as we have here to always use your land covers and probably bring down the hedgerow data as well. I'm not gonna bring down the land parcels yet, although it's useful for printing later because it just keeps the map a bit cleaner. So land covers and hedgerows are being downloaded. Next, you're asked by the land app to choose which template you'd like to use um, to create your plan. Land app restricts users to choose a template before they allow mapping. It's, it just makes sure your data is clean and that the, the, um, the reason you're using the map um, keeps that data consistent as well. So what I'm actually going to do, and I recommend that you all do this first, is always bring your data into the basic payment scheme template first, and then create a countryside stewardship template on top. And the reason for that is it will be really obvious when you're doing your stewardship plan, what the existing land use is, according to the Rural Payment Agency. If you just go straight into countryside stewardship, you're always working on a red boundary rather than a coloured map. So I'm going to actually bring into basic payment scheme very quickly and just call this uh, BPS land cover, like so. And what that does is that then sends a request to the RPA and it downloads my farm's uh, land use data and colors in the, the different um, land use types as well. So you can see I've now got a green parcel for grassland, a darker green for woodland, and all of the arable land has got a red line around it. You can quickly add an arable code or a permanent crops or something, either to an individual polygon, or if you've obviously got lots of polygons, you can right click and select feature type and assign them all to a, a color. 
But what this is always going to be now is this is a reference layer for when I'm building my stewardship. I can quickly see which one, which fields the RPA think of grassland, which ones are woodland, and which ones are arable by my green, dark green, and yellow. The first thing to say is that when you've got this data down, downloaded, all of the data is stored at the field parcel level. So each of my features, each of my polygons have got a, a nine digit with two characters a field ID. Um, and that is predefined by the Rural Payment Agency. When you're submitting a stewardship application, we want all that data to remain as tidy uh, as you can see on the uh, left hand side. So I've got my BPS map and that's my land cover map. And I've also, just to show you, I've got my where the RPA think existing hedgerows are as well through my hedge control. The reason that's important to have just as a reference layer is if you're putting in any capital items relevant to your hedgerows, you might putting in a hedgerow management option or of coppicing, for example, of hedgerows, you need to ensure that the length of hedgerow that you're declaring is either on their existing system or is going to show on your firm app, which hopefully I'll have time to show in a moment. But you just need the RPA to know that there's an existing hedgerow there. So I've got my land cover map, both in terms of the land use for the fields and my hedgerows. What I'm now going to do is on top of that land cover map is just generate a, my first countryside stewardship template. And I'm going to do this using the exact same step as I just did before, which is use template. I'm now going to choose the countryside stewardship template, but I'm instead going to create from an existing plan because I've already downloaded my uh, land cover data. So I'm going to create a countryside stewardship plan from my BPS, but this time I'm gonna call this layer CSS for countryside stewardship. Probably not call it farm, let's just call it farming like this. So, name. great. So what I've now got on the left hand side is I've got three layers. I've got two reference layers that I'm gonna just through the demo keep toggling on and off just to remind myself which fields are arable and which ones are grassland and obviously which ones are woodland. And then I've got a blank stewardship template that's going to allow me to start allocating stewardship options at the field parcel level. And so let's get started. So well, the first thing to, to know is that you can edit these shapes. I can edit these polygons either at the whole field level or I can break them down into subsequent components to then uh, give a stewardship code. So the first thing to do is I can allocate a whole field option down to an option of sort. So this, for example, is an existing arable field. I've not done a farm walk. And so everything I'm doing today is just hypothetical rather than me actually advising this particular farm and what options they should do. But I'm hypothetically going to use an arable reversion option on that entire field. And the way I can do that is I've clicked on the field. I've then gone change. I've then searched for the code I was looking for. So arable reversion. I've then selected it and it is now highlighted or coloured in that particular field with the official Rural Payment Agency styling for, um, in this case, SW7, arable reversion to low input grassland. Okay. As you change shapes, so just to show you if I were to actually change that from SW7 to another, another code, AB8, a couple of things happen. The styling changes, but also quite a few of these metadata points on the right hand side change while you're updating that scheme. And just to talk those through. So I've obviously got the, the stewardship code, which is ABA and the code name, which is what does ABA stand for, which in this case is flower rich margins. I've also got the associated payment rate. So how much am I going to get paid based on the 2023 payment rates per hectare? And then the value of that, which is the, the payment rate times by the hectareage. OK, so all of those data points are dynamic based on what stewardship option you assign. So if I was to, for example, put this back to SW7, you will see that the, both the payment rate per hectare and therefore the subsequent value should update. So it, when I change from AB8 to SW7, the payment rate has changed, the value has therefore changed, but the hectareage hasn't because I haven't changed the shape or size of the field. OK, and that's something that LandApp is going to be automatically doing for, uh, doing for me throughout the entire demonstration. Just to make it slightly tidier, I'm just going to leave the code on for now. And hectoridge. Now, in reality, it's unlikely that you're going to want to put, you know, maybe this whole field in. Maybe there's areas that you need to, you know, just minus off the edge to ensure you're not overclaiming, or you might want to be, you know, putting in some buffer strips. So I'm just going to show you a couple of key drawing tools on this field 
how I can um, improve or you know start to fine tune the stewardship options that fit within this field. So one thing that you can do is you can cut off or split a field based on a, a line of your choosing. And so in this particular field, what I might want to do, for example, is I might want to actually in the northern edge put in a flower margin and that flower or a flower plot that can either be defined by a split. So I can right click on the field and I can split off by clicking once, moving my, my mouse through to the other side and double clicking. And that is now split that SW7 into two components, which has affected the hectorage. So you can see that the total hectorage has now been split. But the metadata, i.e. the field number and the description, has remained constant um, for both of those areas. As these are now independent features, I can assign that northern block to my wildflowers, um, which actually I think is just flower rich, isn't it? Flower rich margins, for example. I've therefore assigned that top block AB8 with a certain hectorage as well. So just to recap on that point, right click on the shape, choose split, and then you can split the field however you so wish, like so. And then you've got components that you can add different options to as well. So I'm now basically, I've taken that 100% field and I split it into three components. However, in that process, because I've used the split tool, the sum of those three parts always is going to equal the, sum, the, the entire sum of that field parcel, okay? If you wanna double check that the field numbers are correctly allocated, you can either turn on the labels. So if I hold shift, select those fields and turn on the field ID, for example, I can manually see that all of these are still part of 2286, 2286, 2286. So I know I've mapped that field correctly. Or if you click on this little folder icon on the left-hand side, the field parcel that you're, you've selected is highlighted orange. And in there, I can see what features make up my field parcel. So within this field parcel, I've actually got an area and this is another reason why using land covers rather than land parcels is a really good idea is I hadn't actually noticed, but I've got a track that was undescribed and is therefore not being allocated a stewardship option. So I can see that I've got that, I've got that um, ease of cross-referencing additional areas within my field parcel that aren't eligible for that stewardship option. If you had used the land parcels and assigned it all to SW7, I would have risked adding an additional 0.14 hectares of ineligible land to a stewardship option. So just to reiterate, land covers for stewardship plans, not land parcels. Now that's me just splitting off polygons. Now you might actually rather, instead of just doing plots or straight line splits, you might want to instead draw margins that are slightly more natural, maybe following the curve of a field boundary or following a hedge line. And so, I'm going to draw a margin that follows down this um, southerly edge of the field. And the way that I can do that is I first select the parcel. So I'm telling the land that which feature I'm um, which field I'm focusing on. I can hit draw and line. And what that does is by default, when you click once, the land up is automatically trying to magnetize or trying to snap to the line of that field boundary. So you, so you can see I haven't clicked again. It's just following it all the way around and I can go all the way around to this edge. I can then double click to finish and then hit the finish. And what I've done is I've firstly just drawn a line defining where I want my margin to go. I can then add a buffer to that line to then define um, the width of that particular margin I'm wanting to create. So I've chosen side one, which is the left hand side on the direction I drew. I can then dictate the width. So I could put a 12 meter margin. I'm then asked, do I want to round the corners, which I can. And Apologies that the, the white and blue is quite hard to see, but you can hopefully see that there's a change in the angle of this corner. And then you can either choose to subtract or not. As I mentioned, if you don't subtract, you're gonna have overlap. So if I don't subtract, just to show you and hit okay, the area of this field has remained 11.18. So even if I assign this to an AB9, for example, a uh, winter bird strip down the side, I'm actually, I've got double counting here. I'm double counting my SW7 and my AB9 because there's overlap. So what you need to remember to do is make those two dimensional by using the subtract tool. So click on the AB9, always subtract the one you want to keep, hit the buffer and subtract. And if you just watch when I hit okay, 11.18 will be reduced by 0.82. So we hit okay. That number is now 10.36. I've hole punched, so to speak, the AB9 through the SW7. Okay, so 
that's just reiterating importance of land covers and it's also reiterating the importance of just making sure you've got no overlapping polygons and how to how to um how to add those other features that you might want to add are what i call floating features so rather than a buffer that follows an edge of the um, field parcel you may want to add a feature in the middle of the um the arable field uh, an obvious one might be a, a lapwing or curly plot and so the way you do that is again you click on the polygon first because that's just telling the land at which field parcel you want the shape to um, sit in so click on the parcel then hit draw and then you can choose from our different shapes um, to draw that lapwing plot now for a lapwing plot i would probably use rectangle because you want it to be square um, and then you just basically click once click twice and finish drawing your um, polygon um, for actually, I know there's a minimum hectare for a lapwing plot, which I think is 0.25, can't remember exactly, it's been a little while, but you can change the width then in this right hand panel to get an exact um, area if you're aiming for a particular um, hectare. So there we are, I've got an exact plot of 0.25 because I've got 50 by 50 meters. Again, I can assign that the lapwing code like this. But I do need to remember to subtract it because I can't co-locate those two options. And again, I go back into buffer, hit subtract, and OK. So I've now got a field with lots of different options in. Um, and obviously, um, this is just more of an example than something I'd actually recommend that Tim does at his family farm. The other thing to show you is as you're drawing these options is on the right hand side, a, a hyperlink that's dynamic will always be available to you that gives you a direct access into the guidance for that particular option. So earlier when I was questioning what the minimum hectare for a lapwing plot is, I can actually click on this hyperlink and that takes me directly into the Docker website where there's guidance on the lapwing plot. So I can then look in here, both in terms of payment rate um, and also eligibility, which I'm not sure if I'm um, gonna see too quickly. Minimum plots of five hectares. You know, it's been a little while since I did these. So there's a lot of all the different locations to so do just make sure high level you're checking the eligibility of this in particular check where you are not allowed to put this as well so where you can't locate this within 100 meters of woodlands for example so perhaps actually i put this in the in the um, wrong place anyway we just want to provide you with the transparency to make the decision but at the moment land app isn't going to flag up that you're within 100 meters of an existing woodland actually i don't think i am or 117 so that's fine and then this side just actually testing 117 actually we're fine 117 113 so i think that's actually eligible because it's within it's further than 100 meters but anyway you're you're the um experts or the advisor that you're working with is the experts land up isn't isn't going to make that decision for you we're just more providing you with a tool to be able to to meet those eligibility requirements um so that's how you draw floating options and a buffer and also just worth saying on this spare field, if you want to just draw a, a complete buffer, you can do that as well in the buffering tool by just going in, choosing side two, dictating the width of that buffer, and then hitting subtract. And now what I've got is I've just split exactly a 12 meter buffer that I can assign a code. If I type in 12. Um, and then you can assign that in a field, an option if you want. Okay, so there's there's whole field buffers, there's partial buffers, there's floating options, um, and there's drawing lines, which I'll come on to now when we're looking at capital options. But hopefully that's covered all the all of the main bases in terms of just the basic drawing tools um, for drawing a feature. One quick trick I want to quickly uh, just show you because we've seen a couple of clients use this, as, and especially if you're doing a lot of stewardships this year, is um, in especially in arable fields. Stewardship options work really well if you make the um, the stewardship um, kind of get rid of tricky corners on fields. And it's almost like if we can encourage most arable fields to become rectangle, um, we can actually encourage you know more efficient farming because they're going in straight lines and they're not then trying to get around those tricky edges. So in a hypothetical situation, if this is arable, what you can do, and I've seen a couple of customers use this, I think Cowdery Estate showed me this six months ago. If I click on this parcel, then go draw and draw a rectangle. I can draw a rectangle from say here to here and go like this. I can then, 
I can play around with these numbers to make them exactly multiplier of, of my boom. So say I've got a 30 meter boom, 300 goes into 30 meters. I can play with the height and rotate it as well and get it to work however I want and move it around with our drawing features. And then once I'm happy with that, obviously it may be more efficient to go the other way, but the principle is, is there. Once I'm happy with that, I can then basically subtract that square and that can be my arable area that I will leave as arable. And then all of the outside of the field, I can start playing around with a series of options, stewardship options, and just coming up with a plan based on that rectangularization of the arable area. So just an idea for you to put out there, if of interest. And again, because I clicked on the field before I um, drew my shape, that rectangle is sat within the um, field parcel number that's correct. Okay. So I've been doing a lot of demoing and just one feature that I want to make, you, make sure you're aware of is we do allow undo. So if you've done anything that you regret or you want to change or you've made a mistake, first thing is please don't panic. Um, just use the undo button. And what that allows you to do is that allows you just to backpedal on what you last did. So you can see the polygon is moving and rotating and then the polygon's gone. So that just gives you the flexibility to, just like you're on a web browser, to undo things you've done. However, if you if you leave the map, if I actually come out of this map and then go back in, the undo, redo resets. And why I'm wanting to show you that is please, if you, if you think you've done something wrong or you want to redo anything, the worst thing you can do is close the web page or refresh. Just please just hold that map there and use the undo button um, rather than um, going out and coming back in again. Okay, so that's drawing revenue options. Um, what I wanted to just quickly show you is when I'm drawing those revenue options, we've got lots of um, data layers that can help inform where those options go. Most of them are available within our data layer library on the right hand side. So you might have eligibility problems if you're in, for example, an AOMB or an SSI, a triple SI. So do check eligibility requirements and toggle on the layers relevant to that particular option. Um, Priority habitats as well, um, especially if you're going into higher tier, although if you're going into higher tier, there's only a couple of days till you're applying. So it might be mostly mid tiers on the call today. But for example, you can turn on priority habitat and start to look at um, which options you might be eligible for based on the, the designation by Natural England. Um, however, recently we've introduced a new set of data that we did do a bit of promotion on, and that we probably could do a bit more on, is we've actually released um, UK CEH's e-planner data as part of a partnership with Sainsbury's. And that is accessible by everyone who's in England with an SBI number for free. So everyone who's doing a countryside stewardship application. And you can access that by hitting the new button, hitting buy data. And then there's two free workflows, both of which I'd recommend you uh, use if you're doing a countryside stewardship because they help you understand where you might want to focus on um, creating certain margins, for example. But the one I want to quickly show you is the ePlanner by UKCEH. If you click on that button, all you need to run it is firstly defining your area of interest by either choosing a plan. So I can choose my stewardship plan, for example, that defines my area of interest. I can give it a name, um, name, for example. I would leave the default settings as cut. Um, that just um, keeps it clean to the edge. And then you just need to paste your SBI number. When you hit buy now, what the land up does is it just quickly goes and requests that data from CEH. And it will serve for me five different opportunity layers where CEH at a high level recommends certain options will go. So if I refresh my screen and have a swig of tea. What I've now been served is five separate layers that I'm not going to spend too much time diving through, but I can high level explain what they are. So there's a layer called pollinators, there's a layer called water resource protection, woodland planting, wet, wet grassland and bird seed mix. Now what these represent is where CEH is quite high level data, I think it's based on 10 meter blocks, but where roughly the priority areas for certain interventions, pollinators are where the soil is lighter, where there's probably south facing slopes and it's pretty free draining, and therefore these areas that are currently showing on the map are the areas that are best placed for things like wildflowers, pollinator mixes, et cetera. Um, water resource protection, these are the areas of land that potentially are slightly heavier, slightly, lie slightly wetter, or have any water resource um, near them, like a stream or a ditch. They might be better suited for tusky grasses, maybe su successional scrub. Um, woodland planting, 
what it says on the tin, areas that perhaps are slightly um, worse quality or heavier soil that might be best placed for woodland planting. They're particularly found near existing woodland blocks as well. So these areas are focusing on that. Wet grassland, where the, where the model was detected that ground might be lying wettest. And then bird seed mix, similar to pollinators, but maybe slightly less free draining, just where the, um, the model detects that you could be you know, promoting bird seed options. We have within our help and guidance, just as a note, because I don't want to spend too much more time on this one. Um, if you search for ePlanner in the help and guidance, we have released a countryside stewardship recommendation. Um, again, it's not advice. This isn't exactly saying where you should do stuff, but which type of stewardship options might be best placed to go in those certain areas. So, for example, flower rich pollinator habitats, AB1s, or if it's an existing grass field, perhaps, you know, looking at GS, GS7. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So do have a look at that and start to use this not to you know do your stewardship for you, just to at least give you an indication of what part of the fields might be better placed for these certain interventions. So the way I would probably use it is I would know I wanted to put in a pollinator mix um, in one of these fields. You know, this one in particular, most of that is priority for pollinators. That might be a good area to put in the um, uh, an AB1. I think was just recommended, but again. Do boot, boots on the ground are just uh, are more important. This is just giving you an indication of what could be um, focus areas, but it might be quite fun if you're doing stewardship, just to, um, I wanted to put things on this side of the field or that side of the field. Just to take that one step further is I can see in this bottom of the corner, this is the, uh, the pollinator resource. So it might be that I'm looking to say, put in a, a stewardship option around the edge of here and it's trying to trace it, which is a bit annoying actually. Let me just go back and show you. You can turn off that snap to line function by hitting this snap button. And now when I trace, I can actually do freehand split, which if you've got a steady hand, can you, uh, make you a bit more, a, a more natural, um, a natural curve. So this one might be the part of my grass field that I take out of management, I fence off and I let it, um, let it uh, um, stay ungrazed for the five years, only cutting it once or twice in that, in that agreement. For example okay so it's just a nice interactive way of you using existing scientific data to help inform your stewardship plan okay so what i want to spend the next five or ten minutes on is i think it was rule number three um, which is just making sure that you're assigning your capital items to the right field parcel so my stewardship plan i've still only got these field numbers but I want to maybe add some hedgerow coppicing in the right place. And I also want to add um, some tree planting and uh, maybe some gates, et cetera. And rule number three was just ensure that you're allocating those, those capital items to the right field parcel. OK, so what you should always do is always click on the parcel first before drawing on that feature. So I've clicked on the parcel. I can now hit draw and say I want to draw a hedgerow or a fence. I need to choose the line option. And I can then draw my hedgerow or my fence, uh, either going through the field or I can follow the outer edge. Now, actually, I'm going to turn back on snap to line because that was not picking it up. So I've turned on snap to line, clicked on my feature and then hit draw and now line. And now I can trace. You can see it's picking up the outside of my field, either this way or that way. And I want to go this way around, double click to finish and then hit finish. And I've now drawn a line that's following the field parcel exactly, that I can add a code. So let me just say sheep netting FG2. Okay, That then automatically has a, a, a meterage associated to it. So I've drawn 913 meters of sheep netting that has got the right stewardship, uh, the right field ID associated to it. So I turn on this field ID and that one. Okay, and uh, turn on this. You can see that the field ID is 2136, they match, okay? So just to reiterate that, I've clicked on the field, hit draw. And this time I'm gonna put some points in the field, one, two, three, four, finish, and then, I don't know, add tree protection, protection of in veteran tree surgery, whatever it might be. Okay, again, field IDs for those are correct. I've got one, two, three, two, one, three, six. Now the error we see, and it's something we're looking to build, to build but at the moment it's, it's completely the responsibility of the user to ensure they don't do the error, is if I had clicked on this field parcel, hit draw, and then I drew the point in this field parcel, like this, and maybe one down here as well, all of those points have got the same field ID. They're all 2136, okay? 
And the reason was that is the reason for that is because I'd clicked on this parcel to start with, then I drew my capital items, and now all of them have got a legacy field ID associated to them, which is this field ID. Okay, so to avoid that, you just need to firstly click on the field you're associating that capital item to, draw that capital item, whatever it might be, hedgerow planting, for example, and then um, hedgerow laying. That has now got the right field ID. Okay, so click on the field, hit draw, draw your points. Now we are looking at ways to introduce a, a, a fixer for that, um, but you're going to have to bear with us on that. But we will share. But just for this this application window, please ensure that you click on the field before you draw the capital item, and don't say draw all of the hedge planting in one go because you've, all of your hedge planting will be associated to, to the same field parcel. Okay, so click on the field, then you can draw the um, particular uh, option capital item that you need. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the assign of the capital items. Again, the price for the capital items, if we can calculate it, should be included on the right hand sides. So the payment rate is slightly different it's per meter and some of them are per unit. There are going to be elements where we don't, we can't calculate the, um, uh, the unit, although that one looks like it's probably something that we, we could fix, but do get in touch if you notice there's any um, any issues with any calculations um, and we can um, look into those for you. The final thing I just want to quickly show you um, uh, before I come on to downloading the reports and creating a, a bespoke print um, is just how to co-locate options. So there's a couple of options within a um, within a stewardship that you can actually have two separate um, polygons for. And so a classic example for that is you've got a GS2, which is your low input grassland. And then you're also getting, say, a hay making supplement or a, um, a grazing supplement as well. The way that you do that is you use a function that we call uh, duplicate, which is this little circle with the plus icon on. Um, and and tr I'll try and illustrate this as best I can. It's so at the moment, I've just got one polygon in this field. If I hit the duplicate button, Actually, let me open this folder, you'll be able to see it happening. If I hit the duplicate button, all Landup does is creates a replica of that field. So what I've got at the moment now is two identical fields with identical codes, both of them are GS2, two hectares exactly. And so what I can do just to demonstrate that slightly more is I can move one of them out of the way. So you can see I've got two polygons of exactly the same uh, shape and structure. So if I wanted to therefore add on top of my GS2, a, I think GS17 is one yeah, lenient grazing supplement, I can now assign lenient grazing supplement to one of those duplicate, duplicated fields. So I've now within my 4770, I've got two polygons. I've got a permanent grassland and I've got a lenient grazing supplement and they're on top of each other. Now that means that in my report, which I'll show you in a moment, this field parcel will have two identical shapes and two identical areas. Um, what you may want to do, however, is because the labels are in the same place, i.e. there's a GS17, if I turn that off, the GS2 is then visible. What I would probably do um, and recommend is just turning the labels off one of them. So maybe turn them off the GS2 so I can just see the GS17. And then within the GS17, change the name to include plus or GS to as well so i've that's a bit of a manual process but at least now in my map when i come to print out both of those labels are now stacked on top of each other rather than being hidden behind each other that's just a little trick for you okay so co-locating um now i've, I've produced a, a fairly uh, arbitrary but hopefully functional uh, stewardship plan and i'm sure the plans you create are going to be better thought out than what i've done and I want to just show you now the different ways that you can export and share this plan. So the first thing that you can do is you can collaborate in real time with your clients. So if you're an advisor and you've got farming clients, or if you're a farmer and you want to you know, collaborate with an advisor, and you can do that using this sharing settings button at the top right. So the sharing settings button you can click, and on here you can add different collaborators to your map. Um, and that permission that you bring them in can either be read only, which means they can come in and view your plan, but they can't ultimately delete or edit anything. They can turn on data layers and toggle on things on and off. You could bring them in as an editor, which just means that they can do pretty much everything you can, um, which means they can delete and add and change things. And then the third level of permission, which is a publisher, 
not quite as relevant for countryside stewardship application at the moment, but if you're in a farm cluster, for example, or a facilitation group, by giving that person publisher rights, it means that they can put your plans next to one, other, one another's to start getting a landscape recovery or uh, you know, a, a facilitation fund view of the different stewardship options. So I can then add Tim as an editor. By adding Tim as an editor, I'm now giving him permission to come in, view my data. He would have automatically received an email if he hasn't already got an account, he would also receive a uh, automated um, welcome to land app, uh, click this button to create an account, et cetera, um, lead in as well. So you don't need to, after doing that, send them any follow up. If you do, however, want to say, hey, Tim, I've sent you an email, um, but I've created a stewardship. You can also send them this hyperlink as well. that just allows them to get a direct link into this particular map. Other ways you may want to export the plan is you may want a breakdown of your stewardship agreement by um, high level, like a high level summary. And you can get that by using the reports button. So if you hit reports and hit add plan, you have a list of all the different plans that you've got. I want to just summarize my stewardship plan and hit done. And that then when you click on that line gives you a breakdown of your stewardship scheme by option. So I get a, a high level summary of all the different options I put in. Um, the total hectareage for those, uh, those polygon features and the total length or number of units uh, for the uh, other features. So for example, for veteran tree surgery, I've just got eight unique features. Why this is important is once you've completed your annex form, it's a really good thing to cross-reference. Have I put everything in my annex form that I want, uh, have mapped on my land app map? Okay. This table can then be downloaded, so you can hit that download button and that downloads an Excel file to your computer. However, for your um, stewardship application, for completing your annex form, this isn't quite as detailed as you need. What you instead need is to click this table view button, and this opens up a, a, a full application schema that's ready to copy and paste into your annex two form. This is a breakdown of every field ID or the OS sheet number and grid number, the, the land use code. So you've got a, at least a, a cross reference from that um, land cover map about what the existing habitat type is. And then also the option title that you put in is hectareage and length and payment rate, et cetera. Okay. Um, this form you can view online on free, but if you want to download it, you now have to be in the subscription. So to export that as a, a downloadable file, you do need to be in the subscription um, process for that. Um, this is where you can start to see whether you have properly allocated those capital items. I've had a couple of clients reach out and say all of my fields are either unknown or all of my fields are um, allocated to the same field parcel because they didn't follow those steps. Now, as a note, if you have, if you do get to the point where you've completed a stewardship and you realize that your field parcels are wrong, please get in touch because we have actually got a tool that can clip it all back together that we're hoping to release soon, i.e. a way of tidying up the field. So don't, don't feel you need to manually go through everything, but I'm really trying to do a you know, proactive way of saying the way that you fix it is this, but if you need to be reactive because you've realized down the line that you've made a mistake, don't panic, get in touch with support. They'd be more than happy to help. And you can do that through this um, chat function at the bottom, which is here, send us a message. Okay. The time. Okay, so we've, we've still got another 40 minutes left of the webinar. So I think 10 more minutes or 15 more minutes of demo, and then we'll go on to the QA because I can see there's plenty of questions coming through, which is great. So I'm just going to spend the next um, five minutes just showing you the printing function and how you can print RPA compliant maps, which means that you no longer need to use your crayons to submit a, a, a supporting map for your um, stewardship application. Okay. So the first thing to say is that we've got a guidance here. If you search for, um, what do I need? RPA print probably. Um, here we go, Countryside Stewardship Scheme Mapping Guidance. That's what I want. So we've got a, um, we've got a, an updated guidance, which is um, here explaining all the different steps you need to take to submit a digital copy of your um, uh, application, both for your option maps, so revenue options and capital options, but also for a fur map, um, which I've not quite touched on yet, but there is a fur template for you to use. So there's a couple of key things that you need to do. You need to make sure that field parcels are visible. You need to make sure you're using the most up-to-date RPA import. So if you've basically not refreshed your SBI number since, um, if you've not refreshed your SBI number since last year and maybe something's changed, just make sure you're using an up-to-date um, RPA import. 
um, make sure things are clearly labeled. So AB9 um, with both the code and the hectridge or the code and the meterage as well. OK, so I'm not going to go through all of these, but please just make sure you read this. Um, including using the reset style button. Um, we by default use the RPA styling, but if you are you know, using um, your own bespoke colors, for example, you've made your AB8s, I don't know, spotty or something like this, just for making it easier to see the difference between the AB8s and the AB9s, make sure you do come in, hit the style and hit reset, and that just goes back to default, okay? So what I would probably do just to get my map ready is firstly, I would turn off all of the labels. And you can either do that by hitting the three dots and hitting select all, and then choosing all of your features. And that should allow you to at least turn off all of those field IDs on mass. OK. Um, and name, I don't know what that is. So I can turn that off as well. So there, I've, I've basically reset all of my um, fields apart from the hectorage I can see here of those ones area like that and the label for this i would then on mass per um per feature um type i per polygon per line and per point just check make sure the labels are correct so if i start with areas turn areas on so for all of them if i'm following that guidance i need to make sure that i've got the code and the hectorage and the field parcel id labeled so i would basically go in here and i'd make sure i've got hectorage like this I would then turn on the code and I would then turn on the, um, what was the other thing? It just said a field ID, uh, sheet ID, parcel ID, this one. Okay, so I've now for all the, at least for all the polygons, I've turned on the labels correctly. However, you'll notice that it's also labeled things that haven't got a use. Once I've then done that, I would then just right click on one of the ones that haven't got a use and it then, and then you can choose select feature type. And then I can on mass turn off all of those labels for the things that aren't actually going into a stewardship application. So that already has tidied it quite a bit. So repeat that process for all your points and all your lines. So select all lines, like so. Turn on the perimeter, turn on the code, and turn on the field ID, no parcel ID. There we are. And then I've got all my um, labels um, correct. Now, what you can do just to show you if there's a bit of a cluster like there is here and it's looking a bit messy. Um, perhaps you can, at the moment, you can't actually drag where that label is, but what you can instead do is you can create a bespoke text point by hitting draw and text like this. And then I can just copy that, that text down. So I can say nine, four, two, nine, BN five and two, three, two, three, zero point one, one meters. Okay. And then have a little arrow label that shows where that where that particular feature is like that. And that means for this line, I can then turn off and it just tidies it up a little bit and makes it slightly less um, clustered. Okay. And you can repeat until you're happy with what the map looks like. Um, then following this guidance, once you've got all the labels correct, just make sure you're um, using the print function. A couple of key things, you need to make sure you've got your single business identifier and application reference number are clearly stated on your map, which I will show you now. And also just make sure you're printing at one of these two scales. OK, so one to five thousand or one to ten thousand. And there has to be a legend. And so to quickly walk through that process is I'm going to hit the print function at the top right, choose a new frame, choose whether I want it portrait or landscape, which for this one, A4. And then the scale, I want to print at a fixed stick scale of one to 5,000, which is that. And actually, coincidentally, that kind of fits perfectly. If it doesn't all fit within one frame, you do need to print off twice, but actually that fits all of my farm in one. Okay. Um, once you're then happy with the print, you can then come and customize it. So you can change everything you need. Um, I'm actually going to give it a header called CSS, SBI, one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever it is, and then application reference. I don't know how many letters have been application reference. We've recently added that you can change the text size of all components now. So I can add that as a um, point, and then you can add at the bottom here, maybe a farm name and email address, for example, at the bottom. Um, one other thing 
when you're zoomed in on premium, if you don't like this styling, you can change that to standard. And then you can also change the black and white as well. So you can get a digital, a digital map for your farm. Uh, the legend you need to add, you can do like so. One thing that I need to look into actually, we used to say the code, didn't we? It used to automatically say, Ben, can you make a note of, of that? I think it should say AB1, like prefixing all of these with the stewardship code. So that's something that has recently disappeared. So I will have a look at that. So that should automatically say what those codes represent as well. So it should look like that. Um, and that should then allow us to order them in the right uh, order as well. Okay. So once you've got your legend and you're happy with it, um, as I not quite am, but getting there, and you've tidied it up, you've followed all that guidance in terms of application reference number and SBI, it's then ready to print, okay? So you can then either print a preview or you can commit to the charges by hitting buy now and calling it a demo. And then that will then export a fully RPI, RPA compliant map for your, um, your use in the application. Um, styled correctly, it's labeled correctly, and it includes a legend for all those different features. And the principle is exactly the same for your fur map as well. Okay, so while that's processing, I'm just gonna check my um, script. We've got a couple of moments until we'll come onto the Q&A. Oh uh, yeah, so while that's printing, I will show you what the output looks in a moment if there's time, um, but that will be available in a moment through my prints, which is found at the top right here. So the, the thing I want to quickly show you is photo evidencing. So quite a few people don't realize that we have actually got um, a new photo layer that's at the bottom left of your screen here. And so you can upload photos and Landat will host them for you throughout the duration of your scheme. So obviously before you go into the scheme, you need to take before photos of all the stewardship um, of all the capital items. And you can upload them in bulk from your computer by hitting this um, plus icon and then searching for uh, photos where I want geo reference, geo reference photos, and then uh, Norny Farm. And I can upload these three at once. And that should then render. And then I hit finish. And then it drops those photos, provided you've toggled it on at the left, of where those photos were taken as well on your phone. So you can see a, an image of that farm. Now, if you're using the mobile app, this is the perfect example of when, you know, the mobile app is useful, is you can basically go, once you've agreed with this client or you've, you've this is your um, stewardship application, take the mobile app out, come onto your, your map of whatever name and take all the photos and they will automatically pre-populate all across this farm. You'll start to see all these different photos. To then be super organized, although it's not essential, I would highly recommend it, is you can actually link the photos to the stewardship scheme. So say this photo was evidencing this capital item, which is my sheep netting that I'm yet to put in. You can see if I click on that photo, I'm repairing this sheep netting. What you can do is you can hit this linked plan button and link that particular photo to your stewardship application. So I've linked one photo to my stewardship. The reason you do that is when you turn off your photo layer, and I just turn on my stewardship, just that one photo is showing. So the photo that's relevant to the stewardship plan is showing. When you start taking hundreds, if not thousands of photos and your RPA inspector comes around and you wanna be really smart and slick and just show them the photo evidence, you can then just get them to turn on the relevant layer and they then have a copy of where that photo, um, where that photo is and the ones that are relevant. You can also then add a description like um, FG2 before, um, et cetera before photo okay um and if oh yeah the final thing to say is that this is a virtual photo so this is a photo that can actually be moved not to say but the the source photo you can't move so this this virtual photo you can move because it's just a link to the project if i turn off the project this one you can't move because it's intrinsically got the data of where it was taken and it has all the metadata that allows that robustness. So that particular photo was, was taken back in March 2018, for example. Okay, I'm going to take a breather while that's bang on four o'clock. So we're going to spend half an hour now going through q and I'm sure there's plenty of things to re-demo. Um, but if you could um, yeah, pop your questions in the chat, I will hopefully get to them now.
Okay, um, starting with A.W. Alston. Um, Dan, area, there's maps with river. Uh, are there, oh, sorry, are there data with mainstream rivers on there, such as EA main rivers maps, for example? Um, so the data we've got, we don't have environment agency river data at the moment. The ones that we have got are flood zones, um, nitrate vulnerable zones and water bodies. Um, if there's a particular rivers data set that you're um, um, a particular rivers data set that you are uh, referring to, please let us know and uh, ideally send us through the exact location of that data or the exact name. But um, main rivers map is not something that we currently have in the land app. Uh, Emma Kasky says, hi, if we subscribe to OS maps already, can we use them on land app? Yep, um, Emma, that's fine. If you um, just get in touch with us through the support channel, we can um, either wire in your existing OS data hub, or if you've already purchased an OS um, license, we will honor that for the duration of the license. So we just need to know the license number and when it runs out, but that will give you access to the OS data through Land App. Um, what if you're not participating in a BPS scheme? So I think you can still apply for stewardship even if you don't claim BPS, but you do need an SBI number for that. I think that's correct, but please Google that because that's a bit beyond my memory, I must admit. But you do need, an, for, to apply for a countryside stewardship, you do need a single business identifier and you do need to request an application pack from the Rural Payment Agency. A uh, question from Vincent, having downloaded your RPA covers and hedge map, is it a good idea to lock these so you not, cannot change them by mistake? Um, yes, Vincent, that's actually quite a good, good point and something we do recommend you do. What Vincent's referring to is once you've got a land cover map like this that you're happy with and a hedge data layer that you're happy with, you can actually lock them by hitting this little padlock button um, at the top uh, on the right hand side, sorry. What that means is when they're padlocked, Either yourself or any other editors can't accidentally delete or change them. So it kind of acts as a nice reference layer as a, as a fullback. So yes, I would recommend using locking when you can. And perhaps, you know, you can even if you want to get super smart, is you can call this, you know, BPS 2023. Next year, you can just duplicate it and call it 2024 and leave that as a locked audit trail of what the land cover was in 2023. Peter, when splitting a field, is there a way to measure where it is going, i.e. 70 metres from end of hedge? Um, so I think I know what you mean, Peter, is basically if I want to split 70 metres exactly from here up this field, maybe I'll do that on the stewardship application. So yeah, I want it, maybe I wanted um, 70 metres from here to maybe make another section. You can either measure by using this measure tool at the top right, and there's a distance or area. So in your case, you want a distance um, and just measure 70 meters like so, which is there. However, when I double click and go to draw, I can then basically cop, I think, actually, no, I need to move that. Actually, scrap what I've just said, sorry. What I would do is draw a line, draw a line, and that will tell you the distance when you're drawing it. So 70 meters is there. So there's a line, hit finish, and I know that's, at 70.03 meters, at least then I can then split my uh, split my polygon to touch the top of that line. And I know I've got a 70 meter block there, um, but I know what you mean. Is there a way of doing it in another process? I suppose the only other thing to say is when you're drawing a polygon, you should automatically, I'm gonna go in this field, when you're drawing a polygon, it should automatically show you the sum of that length. Yes, yeah, so I'm drawing a line. I want to go 70 meters up this way. 70.6, I'm not sure I got, I got 70.3 again. Um, but then you can do a 70 by 78 and it automatically is telling you those dimensions as you're drawing them. So hopefully that helps, um, but let me know if not. Um, BPS data excludes tracks and woodland data as well as areas such as barns, farmyards. This is part of CSS data. Will we end up duplicating data such as land covers and hedges if you download the BPS first? I don't understand the benefits of doing BPS first before stewardship. Yeah, it's, it's a good point and it's not for everyone. The reason I download the BPS first is I really like having that as a back map just to toggle on and off so I can quickly see which fields are orange, arable, which ones are green, grassland, and which ones are dark green, woodland. It just gives me that visual cue for me to then know that I'm assigning woodland to a, the right code. 
saying that, that data should already be contained within your um, left-hand panel anyway. You can see I've got description woodland. So when I'm clicking on this to assign it a code, I know I've got to go into the woodland options, woodland and pasture, because those are the areas that are eligible for that particular land use type. Um, and then your point around, um, uh, as well as areas such as barns and farmyards. So yeah, you, you should, when you download, providing it's been declared on the RPA, you should be able to you know, download your field, um, field bar, um, parcel data. However, in this example, I know this farm owns these barns. So say I was wanting to put one of these barns into a, an infrastructure option, and this is actually probably quite a good thing to demo, is I would need to basically declare to the RPA that those are my, th those are my um, boundaries or those are my features. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. I would probably could just create a new field parcel with these, with these barns in or with this area of interest in, um, either by using uh, land registry. So I can go into uh, ownership, land registry, and basically just take that entire boundary which is already, actually that's too big. No, let's not do that way. Or you can trace Ordnance Survey Master Map by basically on your um, stewardship plan, turning your master map from interactive off to on, and then drawing um, the feature and it should then trace. Yeah, there we are. So let's just trace, so for argument's sake, these ones, it's then tracing OS Master Map for me. So I can create a new field parser with perhaps these these features um, like so. This is then a new parcel that I need to declare through an RE1. I can get the field parcel coordinates by hitting the coordinates button here and getting the field ID within the national grid number. And then I would just basically assign that particular unknown parcel, rename it to um, this, this parcel ID like so. So I've then created it. I've created, in, at least in Land App, a new um, new buildings um, parcel, which has then got all the the right um, metadata in. I just need to remember then to also submit an RLE one form. So I would then create a separate RLE one for that particular feature that I then submit to the um, RPA following their RPA uh, guidance. So I've got a separate plan showing the change. I've got a, a, a field boundary now that I can use to create my um, projects and then taking that just one step further. Then if I want the exact uh, boundary of that building to put into an infrastructure project, um, I could probably the easiest would be just copy and paste it from master maps. So I'd get those two buildings, copy those to my stewardship plan. And then in my stewardship plan, I would assign them to a building or some infrastructure code. Uh, FY, something, farm and infrastructure. I don't know, maintenance of traditional buildings. That'll do. Oh, yeah, give them both a HS1. Actually, this is now actually just something to show. So, yeah, what I've done, sorry, a bit long winded, but I've now got those buildings. I've got an RLE1 that I could submit. I've said I want to put these two buildings into a traditional um, weatherproofing. However, because I copied them from another data layer, in this case, is master map. I've actually got two field parcels that aren't in the correct um, land parcel. What I can do is I can select them and I can send them to my new buildings polygons by hitting the three dots, move to a new buildings. If this is particularly relevant to you, it might be worth watching the recording of what I've just done because I've definitely covered quite a few things, but I've now moved, I've created a new boundary and I've got those new buildings into um, the field parcel with the uh, maintenance of weatherproof buildings with the right field IDs as well. So yeah, quite a few moving parts in that demo actually. So perhaps watch the recording if you need me to recap on that. Well, lots of questions though. Sorry, I didn't quite realize we had so many. Um, question seven, does it already take into account hedgerow buffers edges for cross compliance? Um, I, not sure, I think, um, I need to do a bit more reading on what cost, cost compliance is. Let us follow up on an email with that particular thing. I don't think so. Does it already take into account hedgerow buffers edges for cross compliance? So I think, digging back into my memory, two, you have to take two meters out for a hedgerow as part of your cross compliance. But I think the EFA rules have changed. Um, but I'm not an advisor 
anymore. So you might need to get in touch with advice if you've got any questions on that. Um, how would you select a hedge and choose an option such as hedge laying or BE3? Yep, good question. Um, probably should have demoed it. So um, I've got my hedge data here. And let's just say, hypothetically, I wanted to put this hedge row into my stewardship plan. I would click on it from my basic payment. I'd right click and copy it to a plan. I'd bring it to my CSS. By doing that, I know that it's going to have the right field ID. So it's got the right field ID within it. And then I would just simply change it to coppicing or laying, whatever it was. So I've now got the hedge from my BPS hedge control within my stewardship and within the right field ID as well, because I've just copied it from the RPA. If I wanted the hedge coppicing to extend, I can then draw my line to extend from there to here, for example, and continue that line all the way down. So yeah, you can copy features nice and quickly from your BPS or your land cover maps onto your stewardship agreement. Um, ha, uh, from Tango, if I want to enter say 10% less area into stewardship rather than entering the whole area in case of issues, how do I do that? Yeah, at the um, at FWAG where I used to work, that was something that was you know, good practice. And what you're saying is if this entire field Perhaps we don't want the entire field to be, you know, into the stewardship option and you want to maybe reduce the total area. You can either do that when you're drawing. So you can either add buffers to each of those features and just reduce the size of them. Or what I do see quite often is when you download your schema, when you download your um, uh, table view, when you've got the option area, you can just in that Excel file, create a new column and just do a multiplier of you know, times it by 0.9 or 0.95 to reduce it by a certain percentage. And then all of those options were just reduced by that area. And the reason you might do that is just to avoid any um, uh, mismatches between what the RPA's land cover says and when an inspector comes around and says, oh, you haven't quite got exactly um, 0.79 hectares of um, whatever this is, SW12. So yeah, I would probably on, if you're, if you're wanting to do that rule, I would do it after the fact. I would do it through the table view and just do it within the Excel type format rather than trying to manually do it for each of the polygons, but up to you. Uh, Roger, the AB5 now overlaps with the reversion, how to avoid the AW7 overlap? Yes, Roger, so that, that question might have been asked just before I did the subtract, but it doesn't anymore. So just to show you, if I move the AB5, there'll be an AB5 shaped hole in the SW7. Um, and I did that by subtracting. So just to show you, if I duplicate and then make another S, that has now got overlap and you can actually see through it the um, styling. So just click on the AB5, hit buffer and subtract, and that then hole punches the AB5 from the SW7. Okay. From James, um, hi Dan, maybe a silly question, but to check RPA are happy with these land app maps when sub submitting CS mid tier applications rather than basic annotation on genuine. Uh, sorry, silly question, but just to check, RPA are happy with the land app map submitting. Yes, we'll follow up with an email, but they've on their website, they're, ex they're happy with digital maps, providing that they are clear and as clean as an annotated map. Um, but yeah, please do um, check the RPA guidance um, before submitting. What are the implications of building your application if you do not select the field parcel before creating a new option within a parcel? Is it a way of doing it before the event, or after the event? Yeah, that's, um, I don't know who that question's from, but basically the main problem with doing that, say at the moment, I've got no, I've got one field selected, but I can't remember which one it is. And I go to draw, the risk is either the option gets allocated to the wrong field, or as it did just a minute ago, just to show you that again, if I brought over, say um, this particular feature, this one, and brought it over onto my stewardship plan, it would then just goes within a parcel called unknown land parcel. So if you've got, just before you do download the report, have a look at this, this left-hand panel. If it says unknown land parcel, you can move that feature to the correct field by clicking the three dots and hitting move to, and then you can just choose which parent field that feature belongs in, okay? So in this case, this is outside of my ownership anyway, but you can then move that area from unknown land parcel to one of your chosen ones. So you can retrospectively do it. Um, and as I mentioned, if you've got a big application and you need some support, we have actually got a way of automatically doing what I've just shown you as well. Hoping to release it soon. 
Um, another question from Vincent: Why should why should I use the refresh button and how often? Um, so the refresh button you don't really need to use unless if things are feeling slow or you can use the refresh button, but you shouldn't actually need to do any refreshing during your mapping. The Land app automatically saves, so it, you don't need to hit save at all. Um, the only time I would use refresh is if I yeah, felt my computer was getting a bit slow and it was trying to load too much. Um, I don't think during the demo I mentioned refresh, but if I did, Vincent, please let me know. Uh, another question from Tango. If planting a new hedge across the middle of a field and want to have a hedge with sheep netting either side, but it'll look almost like on the same line, what should I do? Yeah, good question and definitely something that happens. So remember your 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 maps just have to visually represent the location of the, the option and the air, the, obviously the length, if you're using your land app map is also important. So what I would do in that situation is I would firstly just draw the hedge line. So I'm gonna draw a hypothetical hedge line from here to here, like so, hit finish and assign it to hedge planting like this. I would then duplicate by using this button, the hedge row twice. So click it once, click it twice. And then I would just move each of those duplicated ones just to either side like so. And then I would then highlight or hold shift and click on those two outer ones and then change those to FG2. So I've now got two separate, two separate lines, uh, three separate lines, sorry, two of which are FG2, these two um, and perimeter. How you make that look good on a map would I would probably just combine the label for the FG2s and say FG2 in total for this field is nearly 500. Um, and then perhaps, I don't know what the, I need to check the styling rules exactly, but you could maybe make one th thicker or fatter, or perhaps maybe make the hedge dotted, for example, just to make it slightly clearer. Yeah, um, and then just make sure you're consistent with your um, mapping on that. Um, Question from Luke, uh, WS1 and WS3 are not currently showing as options, are some waiting to be added? So Luke, let me have a look. WS1, yeah, it's not an option there. Uh, let me just try a point, is it in there? Huh, uh, I don't know what WS1 stands for. So let, let's hold that thought, Luke, and I will have a look. But Ben, if we can just make a note. Of just investigating WS1, WS3. We're not waiting for any more stewardship options to go live. So they should all be live. And if any are missing or there's any errors, let us know and we will update those as soon as we can. Um, I'm just checking. Yeah, don't know. WS2? Yeah, I don't know. If the honest answer to you, Luke, and we shall do some investigating. Um, fence, fencing options are usually a complete circumference. How do you make a line create a complete field boundary rather than just part of the field? Yeah, really good point. Um, so the easiest way is just make sure you've got snap to line turned on. Um, I'll do it with this field. And let's just say I want to put a full perimeter fence around the outside. Firstly, click on the field first, hit draw, hit line, start at your starting point, and then let the automatic snap. Oh, he says, go on. Why is that not picking up? We are. It's now doing it. So you can see it. The line is now chasing around the outside, chasing around the outside. And then you've got a full complete line that's following the outside of there. If you wanted to go around the other side, it's the same principle. But at least now I've got a line that I know is following the um, outside of that field to the perimeter. If that answers your question. Um, Question from Marcus, it would be useful to adjust and rotate where the text lays when turning on labels. Could be messy in printing off some overlapping, not clear where the labels belong to. Yeah, so it's something that we're still um, trying to improve. So yeah, when I zoom out of this, there's quite a lot going on. And that's why they try, they get you to do one to 5,000 for these smaller maps. Um, that photo will unlink, turn it off. Um, the yeah the labels we try and encourage people to use these arrow annotations you can't currently um they think oh you can ah that's i didn't know you could do that you can rotate I, that's news to me as well so you can rotate the labels um by hitting the rotation thing here but that's only for the free text points that you've done that's not for a label say of oh, this ab8 so if you want a bit more flexibility draw the text point and then you can change the labeling and then just when you go to print, um, 
when I go to print this map, for example, um, you can change this text size as well. So default is 14, but I think you'll get away with it. One to, you can see that you can see how small, smaller ones look better, bigger ones look messy. So you can change the um, size of the labels just to make sure that you're not getting any overlap as well. Um, probably stay at 12 or 11. It's still quite neat without overlap. Um, James says, what about when you have two options in the same hedge, BN6, BN8, and FG2? Yeah, James, you've just got to try and best as possible. I don't think they all need to be flush. You need to make sure the meterage is correct and the label is correct. So the RPA are going to look what part of the field is that in. They're not going to penalize you if it doesn't follow the edge perfectly. So I would just use the duplicate function like I've just shown um, with the hedge row. So you can basically put in a, have the main one following the actual line, duplicate it, bring it in, or, or use the buffering tool and bring it in. But just make sure on the map that there's enough distance between them for there to be clarity that you put in multiple options. And then again, the labels, you can kind of combine those labels to make sure that they are um, uh, as expected. Um, how is a publisher different from an editor? Yes, yeah, so this is actually something we're updating soon. So at the moment, publisher and editor, oh, we've got an update from Defra. Um, publishers and editors are actually, at the moment, the same permission. However, from customer feedback, that's not really what we, what we wanted and what the customers want and what you as users want. So we are actually changing this slightly. At the moment, a publisher does have editor permissions. Moving forward, once we do our um, reconfiguration of collaboration, which will probably be around the end of July, August time, they're two separate states. Just if we read only an editor is, do you want them to be able to edit or not? And then separately, do you want them to be able to publish or not? Which I think is a bit cleaner. So yeah, thanks for picking that up. Um, um, just a note, we've got another about eight minutes. If you do need to shoot, I can see um, a, a couple of people have left. Just please do answer that survey at the end, particularly the question around the RPA, because we want to build up a bit of a, um, a bit of a, a case for digital submissions. Um, so can I retrieve my data without a subscription? Who owns my data? Yeah, it's a really good point. So if you read our terms, you own your data. When you create your map, you own it, which means that you have every right, even on the free product, to download and export your data. And you can request to us to delete it if you so wish. So that's in the terms. Um, the only bit that you now need to be on a subscription for is when you're downloading a Annex compliant form, which is this one. And the reason for that is we really want to encourage people to join the subscription if they've got to the point where they're doing a stewardship application. And that's the reason that you would be downloading that. You've clearly got value from the land app and therefore we need to make sure that we can keep developing the product as we so wish. Um, but the free, um, free users definitely own their own data. Um, and yeah, you can export and share with whoever you um, wish. Um, Julian says, I am still using MapMaker with DRA and Geo files. Can these be inform uh, imported? Um, DRA is not a file format I'm familiar with, Julian. However, uh, the ones we do accept are these four. So you GeoJSON, KML, Shape, and DXF. Um, if none of those are able to be exported from MapMaker, Julian, just get in touch with us either through the chat here. Um, drop us a message and send us, if you're happy to share an example file, myself or my colleague, Ben, who's actually handling the Q&A, would be more than happy to have a look at the, the data and get it um, unlo unlocked to um, uh, unlock to be able to upload to the land app. Um, what is the advantage of this app over DEFRA's own map data? Um, so, it's, yep, good question. Um, so, the, the I think you're referring to the, the magic maps, I think, although please tell me if I'm wrong. So Magic Maps, we host most of the data that's available on Magic within here, like all the different priority habitats, designations, geology, et cetera. However, what you can fundamentally do different on Land App is you can create a plan and save that plan. Um, when you're using something like Magic, it's just every time you come back in, you're starting from scratch. When you use the Land App time and time again, you can always come back to the same plans, update, enhance, and you can do that collaboration as well. So very much different tools uh, for different purposes as well. Um, how do you remove a plan from the list? Um, yeah, so we basically, in our terms of reference, we now allow you to archive your plan. And what archiving does is it removes that plan from the list to start with. So I'm going to archive birdseed, 
I hit archive. You're then given a um, uh, pop up that says, are you sure you want to archive it? Hit yes. Bird seed has now disappeared from my left hand side, which means it's then cleaned by map. So I would definitely archive any unused plans. If you then within three years want to unarchive it, we store it within the database. So you can go into archived at the bottom of your map here. And then I can go back in and I can restore my bird seed map. And that then just brings that data back. So you can by archiving and unarchiving, um, keep your map slightly cleaner. Okay, oh wow, there's so many questions. Um, we've got five minutes left. I can see that there's another 25 or so questions I haven't answered. So we will basically follow up with an email, everything I can't answer in the next four minutes. Um, I will stay online for a further 15 minutes after that just to handle any more questions, but thank you all for your engagement. If you do need to shoot, please feel free to do so, but I will just uh, keep working through these. Um, and yeah, really, really grateful for all the, all the comments. Um, if you accidentally remove a land parcel from your SBI number, is there a shortcut to add it back? Yes, I think this is, yeah, I would say um, something you can do quite quickly. If I accidentally delete um, a parcel here, obviously if you've done this BPS process, I can then just copy that parcel from my BPS and bring it over into my land, my stewardship plan. If I haven't done the BPS process, um, you can just import that file again, and then again, uh, import that file from the Rural Payment Agency, right click and go copy it to your stewardship plan. That should then just reinstate the settings as it was before. Um, we've then got, what's the, I oh know we've done that one, sorry. Um, is the fee for producing a fur map an additional co cost of being a top on top of a, no, so fur maps available for free as well. So if I basically just to show you, if I wanted to create a free use template, for map for file environment record from my land cover map as I did before. That's all available as part of the free software as well. So you don't need to have a paid subscription to do a fur map, and then you can just assign uh, different fur codes like soil erosion, historic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah, that's all part of the free one as well. Um, when I print, the legend is not included. Why? Um, you just need to make sure when you're printing with the leg on the legend, um, you in state the legend itself so you have a you have a button that says use legend you just need to make sure you pop the legend in before um printing and there's guidance on our help page if you need if you need that um how do you add a photo with location data um photos you just need to make sure you take them on a device that has geo referencing turned on i think by default if you're on um apple uh it should already be turned on if you're on an Android, you do need to turn that setting on within your settings. Um, but just, excuse me, Google, how do I turn on geo-referencing on my photos? If you took a photo on an old digital camera or maybe one of those um, DSLR type cameras, it probably won't have a GPS location. And hence why we want people to use the mobile app because that by default steers people to use um, geo-referencing. Um, is the intention that Elm and B&G Habitat Banks will be integrated into the future? Definitely the intention. We are working as much as we can with, I think we've got about 10 or 11 ELMS tests and trials and pilots using the land app. We really want to help government prove that, you know, prove this is a solution. We want digital submissions. We want the, the movement away of paper-based maps and spreadsheets, and we want it to be all digital. Um, and hence why there's a question at the end when you leave, because that's definitely part of the ambition is we want to catalyze the markets, reduce admin costs by using tools like the land app. But we know, you know that, that there's going to be a lot of learning in that process and it's not for everyone. But for say the 60% of applications that are interested in doing it, it would save the RPA and DEFRA a huge amount of time if they um, you know, accepted digital, um, digital applications. Um, so last couple of questions before we're going to do a bit of a hands up and you want to come off mute um, session. Uh, Martin, if you were trialing the beta test of the mobile app, do you have to delete? And how do you upload the new live? Ah, so Martin, you, yeah, the mobile app, you just need to make sure you've updated it in the app store. Um, depending on how long ago, Martin, you were given access, I imagine you were one of the first ones, you might need to actually just re-download the new app from the, um, the, the app store itself. However, you shouldn't have to move any data. I think all the data should almost always be available to you. Um, so um, Luke, if you are adding P2000, P2021, et cetera, options, which fall under WDT, 
the two but do not have payments in their own rights would you duplicate the use the duplicate trick to get the measures showing each parcel or would you have a separate project so yeah loop what i would probably do for a woodland management plan say i was putting um let's just very quickly this block into wd2 i would probably i would just bring over that particular wd2 project onto a new countryside stewardship plan and call this wd2 options like so and then i would just use and turn off that one as well i would then split this into my wd2 options so hypothetically like this and then in here i would add all the relevant p so coppicing can be that block for example i mean this is obviously arbitrary Ooh, uh, like that that can be uh woodland what else is in there then selectively fell and then maybe draw the uh i don't know the deer fencing that i'm putting in as well i would say that's probably cleaner um you still can use the um stewardship template but at least then i've got a wd2 option which is separate to my stewardship application itself which is just where the wd2 is happening okay that's what i'd probably recommend although happy to take guidance on that um how do i remove an option for a parcel not change it just remove it so there's no option yeah ruth good question um so if you've assigned say i don't i no longer want this to be sw7 um, but I want everything else to remain. If you hit change and just go on common, there's one called area that just removes all the payment values, et cetera. And then you can just turn the styling back to zero and that should then look the same. Martin, uh, um, Dan, I use circles to measure, measure to set the diameter. Oh yeah, good point. So if you're interested, as Martin was saying, when you draw a circle as when you draw a rectangle, on the right hand side, you can dictate the radius. So if you need to draw an exact circle for whatever reason, muck heap, AD plant, you know, whatever else, cop circles, whatever else you're drawing, you can change the radius in that right hand side. Um, I've appreciated we've gone well over um, time. So I can still, there's over 100 people still on the call. So if you're happy for me to keep talking for another 10 minutes to go try and get through as many of these questions as I can. However, if someone's got a burning desire to come and raise their hand, if there's anything, I'm happy to unmute people as well. But I will keep going, um, if not. And um, thank you for your attention. It's great. Um, but like I said, if you do need to leave, please do. Just please answer that survey question that should automatically pop up um, as you leave. Um, ePlanner creates lots of bizarre data on the map, i.e. wetland and woods where there are none. How to remove um so yeah basically those data layers from ePlanner are just indicative layers so you can remove them just by right clicking on them and archiving that whole project or if there's particular parts that you don't want you can delete by right clicking on that bit of woodland and deleting it okay it's very much there just to be an ind indication we know it's not perfect it is quite crude but it is quite a nice way of ho homing in on particular options especially for um um especially for moving either side of the um what do i mean uh, especially when you're trying to choose which side of the field you want to put the option in um tom hi dan i noticed your print cost was 100 pounds from our forestry for our forestry application we need roughly 15 of these prints is there a way around this ideally we want to use os map and not one of the free maps yeah so tom at the moment the only um ordnance survey gray scale map we've got is this ordnance survey light that the pricing jumps quite significantly when you go for a certain area. So this is 97 pounds because I can see master map. If I come out slightly, there'll be a point where it goes down quite, quite significantly, 100 pounds, 101, 17 pounds. So I would say if you get over scale one to two, five, two, four, six, uh, I think it's one to one, there's this definitely a point, yeah, 5,100, it then drops quite significantly in price. So I would, probably just print just above that that um that area on the os on the os one to get a slightly um cheaper uh rate the reason for that is you just won't get the buildings and tracks because it's no longer master map you've mentioned it in your question but there is a free map called uh open street map so if you print on open street map you don't have to pay but it's not as tidy and it looks slightly messy um we're exploring other options um, Kirsty, if I upload lots of photos from an existing collection on my hard drive, can I move them into positions on the map? So um, 
Kirsty, unless they've already, unless they've got georeferencing contained within them, unfortunately not. If they have got georeferencing in, you can. So it's just going to be the case, a case by case basis, I'm afraid. If they're taking on an old digital camera or, you know, have been digitized another way, unfortunately you can't. Uh, question from Martin. Dan, do you know if the RPA accepts multiple fields on an RLE1 to update hedge data? Lots of this lots of bits missing in the RPA and I want to do hedge laying. Yeah, so I think Martin, you can do a single RLE1 application. You need to fill out their RLE1 form, but in that application, there, there'll be multiple rows where you can do multiple fields at the same time. You don't have to do a separate application for every single parcel. Um, question from Ruth, can you copy a shape from an existing layer such as schedule monument or triple SI? Yes, Ruth, you can. So just turn that layer on. Um, so scheduled monuments, a good example. I turn that on, there's one here. I can right click on that particular scheduled monument and hit copy to plan. And I can bring it across to my um, stewardship application, for example. Just bear in mind that that will go in as a unknown land parcel unless you move it across. Question from Chloe Edwards. How do you factor in utilities? Are there any data layers that show the location of utilities. Yep, we've got a data uh, column or called utilities. We haven't got loads in there. Ooh, sorry. Uh, we haven't got loads in there, but we've got gas and electricity pylons and locations. So if I turn on all of those, um, you should see some, but there's not, it's not a huge, if there's a particular data set, there we are. Um, it's not a particularly great data set, but if there's a particular utilities data you need, let us know. But this is showing you where the existing substations are, the existing cables, uh, overhead cables, and the existing pylons as well. So they, there's some in there, but not all. Can we do fur maps in the same way? Yeah, Lily, hopefully I covered that just a moment ago. But yeah, you can do fur maps in exactly the same way as I've just shown. Download the field parcel data, get it across to the farm environment record template, and then build your fur map in exactly the same process. Um, we want to use this management for ancient woodlands with no commercial objectives. Is it a relevant tool? Yes, Jeremy, I would do exactly what I've just shown for, um, uh, for the question that Luke asked, is you can just bring over that ancient woodland block, use the stewardship template, but you can actually just use all the woodland management codes, like where you're going to selectively thin, where are you going to build a glade, are you going to fence, etc. So that should allow you to, um, to, to start drawing a management plan for a, an ancient woodland as well. Question from Kit. When you merge parcels, sometimes it leaves lines unlinked. Um, sometimes it leaves lines unlinked to anything else within the middle of the shape. Yeah, so Kit, when you merge, if the um, polygons don't perfectly touch, you get this little like geometry error, particularly if you're merging um, HM registry. I would probably say um, if you're desperate to work out how to fix that, it, it doesn't happen that often, but when it does, you can tidy it up. Um, I, I think during the estates webinar that's on YouTube, I spend five or 10 minutes explaining how to tidy that up. Um, I hope that helps. Um, not super, still loads of questions. Okay, we're getting there. Um, We've got 10 more. A question from Mick. Hi, Mick. Um, I've struggled to select a line drawn on a field boundary without selecting a field. How do I do that easily? Yeah, Mick, that happens um, just because it's super fiddly to find the line. I would say the easiest thing to do is say you've got a, a rogue line drawn down here like that. Uh, and it's okay. When I click off it, I, there's a line there, but I can't see it. And then quite hard to click on it. What I would do is I would open up the folder on the left hand side and then you can see the lines here so I can click on the lines on the left hand side and you can see it's highlighted the one I want, which is that one. So it just makes it slightly easier to find the line that I was looking for rather than trying to click it on the map, click it in the folders on the left. Um, is there a cost to print the map needed for CS application? Yeah, I've just covered that, but there is because you need to use the grayscale, you have to pay um, for a one five thousand. 100 print it's about 18 pounds we are looking at a cheaper version but yeah unfortunately you do need to pay at the moment um philip sutton green can you take off the land app watermark when printing maps yep yeah. so when you go to print philip you basically are um you can when you hit preview that gives you a download with all the land app watermarks but when you actually buy now 
the download that you get from there won't have any watermarks. And if you want to get rid of this logo at the top right that says Land App, if you just hit this Move button with the Land App logo, you can actually hit the cross and get rid of the Land App logo up there as well. So you don't need um, um, you don't need the um, logo to be there. And just to quickly show you in the prints, I can probably doubt. Yeah. So here's a download of the print that I created earlier. So this is what this is what I generated with you um, earlier. So you can see that there's no watermarks on it. I left the Land App logo in that you can remove. But actually, there's no overlap between the labels, and it's it's fairly neat. Um, which data layer contains upland breeding bird areas or priority species? Yep. So this Marcus is something that we still don't have a license for. So we still, unfortunately, do not have the license to host the data about priority species. Um, I think it's an environment agency data set. It's we we've. we've tried before so at the moment you just need to go to magic maps to get the priority species and cs targeting layers i'm afraid but it's something that i would like to see um, in the land up as soon as we can um how do i refresh the sbi number before starting the application map yet yeah, at the moment you can either import just a, a fresh a fresh uh, map and then transfer data over by copying and pasting or for those on the subscription you can actually import just um particular areas so say i just changed I don't know, just this field parcel down at the bottom you can actually import just specific areas using this import large holding button and what that allows you to do is that allows you just to import a particular parcel of land through the rpa download like so and you can just download a refresh I don't know if that's no it's not there but you can download a refresh with your sbi number just of that particular parcel um, I built a series of some compartments in my forest. This I then imported a land app. What's the relationship between my forest and land app? And do I need my forest? Yeah, so my forest, we know that um, over there, they're good friends over there. They're definitely doing a slightly different thing at the moment. Um, so that land app is helping this pre-application. What my forest does allows you to, you know, consider stocking densities, deer management plans, et cetera. However, I see our um, applications over time getting closer and an integration is definitely needed. Um, you can move data between the two, like you've said, but I do think there's more that both of our organizations and softwares can do to work together to make it easier and more seamless to do that. It's just everyone's very busy at the moment. Okay, final four questions. On the app, can you add a point or line where you are in the parcel? Uh, on the Oh, on the mobile app, can you add a point or line when you're in the parcel? and it'll appear on the map. Okay, so what you can do currently on the mobile app is you can take a photo and you can label that photo and that photo will then be a location. So then you can say, okay, I was stood here and I took that photo and you can add um, descriptions, et cetera, like Beetle Bank starts here, for example. Version two, which is we're expecting to be ready by October probably, will allow you to actually draw those shapes. So yeah, the mobile app's not quite as good as the land app on desktop, but it's on the way. So what's the benefit of creating an RLE one plan on land app versus just filling out the form? So the main reason you'd use that land app is just so it's a, it's a way of evidencing the RLE one. So as you when you submit an RLE one, you need the form, but you also need a, a, a visual to show what's happening to that field. The land app can provide you with that, that, that supporting evidence of what the field numbers have changed. And I did quickly skim on it earlier, but we've got an automatic way of telling you what the field ID should be. So say you're RLE one in this block out, if you go into coordinates and then hit grid field number, you can then get the exact field number for that particular central point, which in this case is here, following the RPA logic. Um, does data layers highlight less favorable areas? The data layers don't, but I'm pretty sure that when you download it to BPS, less favorable areas are, uh, yeah, EFA. Uh, wait, no, you want less favorable, LFA. No, at the moment, I don't know if we do LFAs um, as a data layer. And then what level of detail do you have for water supply? Um, what level of detail there for water supply? So water supply as a stewardship option, you can draw on. So you can draw lines to say, I want cattle pumps, et cetera, or pipes, livestock pipes. And then infrastructure wise, we've only got national utility data layers. So we haven't got a great, um, 
great series of um, data sets for utilities yet. But as I say, if there's anything particular data layer wise, drop us a message. We've, we're, we're keeping a track of every data layer that's requested and voting them up if they're requested twice. So we try and run in a bit of a democratic um, way. So the more it's requested, the more likely it goes in. OK, deep breath. We've made it. That's all the questions asked. Um, only 15 minutes overrun. Thank you all so much for your time. I'm happy to sit here if anyone wants to raise their hand and come off mute. If not, session was recorded. We put it on YouTube over the next couple of days. Good luck with all the stewardship applications. And I hope that um, what you've learned today will help you make those um, you know, applications all the better and more efficient. Thanks for your time. So we've got one hand up. Great. So Luke, I'm going to allow you to talk. So hopefully you can come off mute now and um, ask any questions you like. Hi, Dan. Thank you. That was uh, very, very helpful. And uh, well done for keeping on going for an hour and a half, an hour and three quarters. Thank <laughs> you. Bit of a sprint. Um, bit of math, yeah. Well done. Um, all, of the, all those points are really helpful. Um, Something I've noticed, particularly where you're copying, so on one of the applications I'm working on at the minute, um, the the base the base for the application is obviously copied from the land covers via the by the sort of the BPS baseline. Um, but then we had a couple of other parcels which we then kind of brought in, which weren't on that SBI for whatever reason. One of them's newly registered, um, and then I can't I can't remember why. But basically. We've not, I've now got a layer which, for some reason, not all of the shapes have the same set of um, features. So if I select all, I, I can select all of the feature type, um, but I can't manually um, sort of manage the labels in the same way that I can if they all had the same fields. If that makes sense. So some of the parcels must have must be missing the um, the parcel ID yeah okay i can quickly Field. show you luke um yeah okay so basically you're right depending on how the, the data is created will impact what metadata we have within yeah. the right hand side yeah and so, so i think quick, quick way of saying it yeah yeah so no it's okay so basically what we've got is if you hypothetically say i want to bring a this land registry parcel over into yeah. my stewardship because it's a newly declared bit of land so i basically have copied it over from from the hm registry and I've got now a parcel mm -hmm. on the right hand side, but on the, at the moment it contains title number and Inspire ID, but it doesn't have the same metadata as this one, which is like field ID, sheet ID. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what you want to do is you, you want to basically create that metadata because at the moment this parcel is sat in something called unknown land parcel. And so is that actually, so is that um, schedule monument I copied over earlier. And so what you can do is you can move, either move it into an existing parcel. So hypothetically, say it did actually belong to this land. It's still part of the same parcel. I can move it into 2136 by hitting the three dots and move to and choosing 2136, which may be the right thing. Or more than likely is this has just got a new field number. Yeah. So what, what I would then do is I would basically get from this coordinate system the new field number, which is SU944410. That's yep. the new field number. I would then basically rename this unknown land parcel with that field number and then basically just populate in here the parcel ID and the sheet ID. And I can give this a field name, new field, like this. And now it should, technically, when I click on this, it now has got field ID and parcel ID. So if I select all, all features, I want to turn on then is now giving me the ability to do what you've just said i think that is fantastic i didn't realize you could edit the metadata like that yeah so you can edit uh, yeah and then perfect. you can edit it in here so you can then change oh i think you can only edit the meta i know you can in here as well yeah so you can edit the sheet id as well if you want for existing ones or you can create a new parcel from unknown land parcels in this left hand side Brilliant. That seems to have uh, that seems to have fixed it. Cool. All right. Well, yeah. Let us know if there's any other questions. Um, Excellent. But... Thank you very much. No problem at all. Cheers. Okay. We've got Vincent. I'm going to bring you online now. How are you doing, Vincent? Thanks for joining. Can you hear us? Okay. 
Uh, Vincent, are you there? If not, I can move over to Daniel quickly. Hang on, unmute. There we uh, are. Hi, Vincent. Go to table view. Yeah. And um, as, as a check to make sure you haven't got any overlaps, would it be possible in that uh, form before you download it into Excel? You can do it going to Excel and, and do it by sort and everything. But is it possible that it would highlight when your options don't add up to the total field size? Mm. Yes. Uh, so it had a red alert like you do on the filling in the uh, BPS return. Mm. It's a good idea and it's something that we could potentially do. So we've hopefully, like I said during the um, presentation is we've got a tool that we're calling like an RPA field cleaner, which can basically take um, your BPS or your stewardship and just basically run it back through any updated field parcels. During that process and Ben, this is probably one for you, who's my new technical support, who's you know given me a lot of headspace. We perhaps could flag up when the sum of the parts is greater than the whole, i.e. when the sum of the options that you've got in that table view yeah. uh, is bigger than the total field size that it belongs in. It's definitely something that we could potentially do. At the moment, we don't do it and you have to do it yourself through Excel. But Ben, maybe we can take that away as an action. Um, and Vincent, it's a really good point. And if that would be useful, you know, that's why we're here. So can definitely explore. Okay. Um, Great, thanks, Vincent. Um, any other questions or you, is that your main? All happy? Okay, perfect. Uh, I'm gonna let Daniel come on now. So I'm gonna move Vincent away. And Daniel, you're welcome to come off mute if you can. Dan, can you hear us? I can, yes, thank you. Uh, brilliant, this is not a stewardship question, but it's a land app uh, problem that I'm occurring quite regularly and other colleagues of mine who also have the organization of facing this. When we when you go onto the ownership layer, the freehold, and it mainly affects uh, us in County Durham where there's been a lot of mining activity. Uh, we When we try to click on uh, a title, occasionally we get a large mineral title above it and we can't click on the individual title uh, beneath it. I was just wondering if you could advise or give your uh, opinion on this, if that's if that all makes sense. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. So you're basically saying where there's overlap within this freehold data set, LandApp doesn't currently give you a solution to choose the one that's below. Yes, and it, it's it's quite frustrating when when we're doing work for clients and we go onto the register onto the registry uh, layer to find out what exactly they own. And if you've got this large mineral title above it, you can't click on the ones beneath yeah. it and uh, find out the information that that you require. By any chance, did you speak to Simla today or yesterday? Uh, through In, I've, I've initially made the inquiry, um, I think it was yesterday evening. Okay, yeah, because Simla, our customer success manager, mentioned this to me this morning, and I think we've got a potential route forward. So don't hold your breath, but Simla will reach out if we think we've got a fix. But we might be able to just serve to you all of the polygons within an area, and then you can manually readjust them and then see the title numbers below. Oh, that's brilliant, yeah. But As I said, it's, it's just something I just thought I would just mention that because I didn't know if other, other, other users have... Uh, had this problem before but i thought may as well contact them via the, yeah. the website and mention it on here as well yeah no that's really useful daniel thank you and yeah i will um see what we can do and get back to you if we've got a solution but i, under, I understand the problem and we, we we're, we're aware of it champion thank you very much thank you um great who else is anyone else uh, martin so i will bring martin steer you're welcome to come um Hi, Dan. Can you hear me? I can, Martin. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, that was brilliant. Fantastic. It led me to an idea that we ought to have just a, a, a sort of a, an hour when people do a QA and a uh, over the phone because you can learn so much from other people. So. Mm. Yeah, well, de My definitely. Thing was, um, just, on, yeah, just on SFI, um, I noticed this Moreland option, and I don't do a lot of those, but it says the criteria they're using is above the moorland line and i found it on um, magic map um but 
if you try and zoom in, so you've got some detail um, on Magic Map, you can't, um, uh, it, it just completely disappears. And I don't know whether you, know, you were saying that you, you, you're trying to engage with the, uh, the environment agency or in the data, but whether you can, whether you could get that one in because it's really good for SFI as that comes on um, or on stream. Yeah, so what do you, you know go on, category is Yeah, there? oh golly. Um, is it designations? It's in there somewhere. If you try, try, try designation. Oh, yeah, more than Here we are. Land based stat. Oh, it's a statutory designation of more than Okay, yeah, that's. Yeah, so if you put that on, Let's but then try and place. zoom in. There we are. I see. If you try and zoom in, it disappears, and you need it sort of almost at field level. I've got, you know, I've got several fields, because if you ah. look in the instructions for SFI, it um, tells you that um, if most of the field is in, if most of the parcel is in the moorland line, then you can do it. But it'd be really useful. I did send an email about it, but I know how busy you guys are. Yeah, okay. Let me, because um, we're quite keen for all statutory designations to be available. That's quite a key thing to have. And the fact that it's, it, statutory. it's really key for, because more, more, yeah, more and FSI it, it, it is one of the ones that's active now. Yeah. Okay. Noted. Thank you, Martin and Ben. If you can add that to your list, that would be super useful. I'm voting um, it up. I'm voting it up verbally. <laughs> a verbal vote, though. That. I think it's worth. Yeah. Thanks very much. much. That's really excellent. Yeah. You've had a long day. It's brilliant. It's, it's been good. And thanks for having us. We um yeah happy to help. And yeah, let 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 me stay in touch. Um. Yeah. Thanks, Martin. Uh, Daniel, you still got your hand up. Is that a legacy hand? I um, will let, uh, there's someone called CF. I'm going to let you come in first. CF, you're welcome to join and unmute yourself. Uh, hi, um, it's Craig, sorry. Um, how, uh, um, sorry, does the app use a different password than the website? Because I'm trying to log in onto your land app on an iPhone and it won't accept the same password I use on your website. So, so from my phone, I have logged on to your website, but trying to use the same details to log on to the land app hmm. doesn't work. Interesting. So it should it should be the same. So are you at go.thelandapp.com forward slash something? Yes. And and the password saved in my password, so it's sort of uh, it's exactly the same password that I'm using. I'm not typing it in. So mm. um, I don't know. They should be exactly the same. I would probably recommend, even though it sounds like you're not, you might be better off just resetting your password and then updating it on the phone. That would be the only way I'd know That's how to get out. What I just did actually, I deleted all of my passwords in the. Uh, keychains and the password and and then change my password uh, requested a password uh, reset and yeah. did it on the phone so that i got the I'm same sure. data everywhere and okay. it still doesn't work i'm sure yeah. you do craig but just to double check the mobile apps for the pro subscription have you got that it's, no, I, I don't have the pro subscription. But I think Ben is logging on on the website. He's just logging up on the web website through the mobile, not through the mobile app. I think it sounds like Craig. You're not using the mobile app, are you? You haven't downloaded Land app from App Store. I have. I just did, and I tried to sign in. And it ah, okay. So you're trying to download to the mo the on the mobile app, like the yeah. Land app mobile. Yeah. To, to basically to do that, you need to be on a professional subscription. So it's it's part of this um you need to activate it through a professional subscription so okay. you can't log in without so what does out of interest what does the message say does it say incorrect password or does it just say incorrect no? password interesting let us look at that um yeah okay thanks craig um what i would recommend just in the super short term if you um on your desktop if you message support through here they should be able to help you um, customer support will be happy to help. They probably might have to do it tomorrow now, since we're at one minute to five. Yeah, but, it, just um, says, it says incorrect sign-in details. Yeah, 
Okay, well, sorry you're having issues. Hopefully they can resolve it for you tomorrow. But yeah, if you drop us a message on support or fill on the website, there's a support button, contact us page, and then you can fill in support and just write a quick note there and one of the team can reach out with you tomorrow, reach out to you tomorrow. Okay, um, thanks, Craig. Thanks for joining. Um, okay, I think everyone, we're going to call it a day. Thank you so much. There's still a number of you still on the call, which is amazing. Um, but hopefully you found today useful. Please answer the surveys as you leave. And yeah, really great to have you with us and we'll keep an eye out for any follow-up webinars or Q and A's we might host. Okay, take care and have a nice day. Bye-bye.